Hey guys, let's talk about asthma. So asthma is um, very similar to a lot of other diseases we talked about where there's an overreaction of the body to an allergen. Um, the difference with this one is, you know, we talked about like allergic rhinitis where you have the runny nose, itchy, watery, um, but this is where you actually have an inflammation of the airway. Um, which leads to constriction of the airway or closing, narrowing, blockage of the airway, and then mucus, mucus production. So, you know, this is a lot more serious because this can lead to actually life and death, um, you know, problems where the airway completely closes and there's no oxygen getting into the body. This is a chronic illness. And, you know, I've heard a variety of people that have it or have kids that have it say that it went away. Maybe that's possible, but generally it's considered to be a chronic illness. Um, and the thing that's different about it compared with like COPD, there's a lot of things that are different, but the, one of the biggest things is that it has periods of exacerbations and then things are okay. So in other words, I could have asthma and be doing fine. If I'm taking my medicines and medications and things are going well, that's great. And then, um, you know, I can have an attack, but like when I'm having an attack, it's really not good. But when I'm not having an attack, I can live almost a normal life. Um, whereas with like COPD, like they're always feeling pretty bad. They're always kind of struggling to breathe, no matter if they're having exacerbation or not. Um, so yeah, um, overall the triggers, you know, think of the allergic rhinitis triggers. So it can be things that are outside um, and then, um, you know, like um, pollen, you know, animal fur, stuff like that. Um, and then also a big thing is exercise and activity. So commonly like kids usually um, are diagnosed with this early on and um, they'll be like outside of the playground playing and then they'll be like, oh, they, they can't catch their breath after like playing outside. So like I mentioned, the patient's gonna complain of chest tightness. So it's gonna feel almost like, <clears throat> excuse me, <clears throat> um, like a band tying around their chest, kind of um, really, really hard to take breaths. Um, that constriction is that airway narrowing. They're also going to have wheezing and wheezing kind of sounds like a whistling sound. And what that is, is there's all that mucus that is forming in their air, um, in their um, airways. Um, it's uh, the air that's trying to escape around it makes the whistling noise as it's trying to escape it because of all that mucus production. Um, and then we're gonna complain of uh, shortness of breath and having difficulty breathing. So um, the treatments, you know, of course, my first priority is I need to open that airway. So in other words, I need to get in there um, where uh, I need to get into where the patient can actually breathe. So opening the airway with medications like bronchodilators, that's going to help to um, open that airway. And even if there's mucus present, it will allow the patient to breathe a lot easier. Um, and bronchodilators, and this is what we're calling, uh, we usually call the short acting beta agonist. They help to rescue me. So if I'm having an acute attack and my airway feels like it's closing off, I'm having that chest tightness, that's going to help to open that right away. Um, <clears throat> while that's great and I can open it, that's really just a band-aid for a bigger problem. I'm having an allergic response. So I also need medications that are going to decrease that allergic response. So in other words, I need to stop overreacting. Um, so I need to take things like inhaled corticosteroids and that's going to decrease inflammation, but it's also going to help me. So I don't keep showing up reacting all the time. And I can also, um, over time, use oral medications like leukotriene receptor antagonists, which stop that allergic response from happening as often. <clears throat> but you can see as, as a whole, like first and foremost, if I'm having an acute attack, I need to open up. But, you know, long term, you know, if I, this is something like no matter what, like every time I go outside, I'm going to be exposed to all these things, I'm going to react. I need something that's going to stop me from reacting. Because again, after a while, bronchodilators stop working as effectively. And sometimes those airways can get co so constricted, like I said, it can be life or death. So I, I want to really stop myself from having so many exacerbations and attacks. Um, they may also require oxygen therapy, just depending on the severity of their attack. My role as a nurse as a whole is to teach them about the asthma action plan. Um, and I'll talk about that on the next slide, what that is. I need to teach them correct inhaler use, how to properly use their inhaler, how to store it, how to clean it. Um, you know, and I want to do teach back with them, make sure that I can see that they actually know how to use it correctly. Because as much as these medications can be life-saving, they're only life-saving if they're used correctly. Um, I want to teach them to take their inhalers prior to activity. <clears throat> so in other words, just kind of like everything else, like we talked about taking your antihistamine before coming into contact with an allergen. I can also take my bronchodilator before things that I know are going to cost me to have an attack. 
Um, I want to teach them about a peak flow meter, which I'm going to talk more about on the next slide. The asthma action plan and the peak flow meter kind of go hand in hand. Um, <clears throat> then um, as a whole, as the nurse, I also want to like look, um, do regular serial lung assessments, look for complications or worsening. And for a patient with asthma, you know, that wheezing, it can be a pretty scary sound. It kind of sounds like they're really strong. It's like, uh, uh, you know, it sounds like really scary, but you know, what's even scarier is no lung sounds or like diminished lung sounds. Cause that means that there's no air getting in as scary as that wheezing sound is. That means that they're actually breathing and getting air. Um, if there's no more of that wheezing, that means that there's no air passing, which means that airway is closed. That's really scary. So I definitely don't want that to happen. So, uh, you know, if you sit there and you think that things are getting better, cause you're like, oh, the wheezing's gone. That might not be a good sign. That might mean their airway completely closed. <clears throat> so always be looking for worsening and, you know, correlate that with their symp other symptoms. I want to teach them to avoid triggers um, whenever possible. Um, and then medication adherence. A lot of asthma is maintenance. Take your medications, keep up with your asthma action plan, check your peak flow meter daily. So um, knowing education about what is expected of them and how these medications are going to help them is going to be um, really key. Like for example, um, you know, most patients um, or a lot of patients that come in, you know, that have an acute attack, we ask them like, hey, how stuff been going with your, you know, medications? And they'll be like, oh, well, you know, I've, I've had to take my um, bronchodilator more, but I've been doing okay. You know, and that's usually like a warning sign. If I'm having to like, you know, remember that like a bronchodilator, it's a great medication. It's going to work, but eventually I'm going to build up a tolerance. Um, and so if I'm having like, think of it like a band aid. it's going to fix like, it's going to temporarily like rescue me from a problem. But if I'm having to constantly be rescued or if I have to constantly be putting band-aids on a wound, like I'm really just covering up a much bigger problem. So um, a lot of times if a patient is, having to use their inhaler a lot, maybe they need more medications like a long acting something, uh, uh, so like a long acting, um, uh, we call it beta agonist um, or a long acting steroid or something else that's going to, um, uh, what do you call it, um, help them like, you know, to have better coverage. So it's really just about noticing trends and patterns so that they can seek help when they need it. But, you know, patients don't know, like they don't know what they don't know. And so um, it's really our job as nurses to help kind of fill in that gap and help say like, hey, you know, this is how it should be. If things are getting worse, um, if you're using this medication more, like you need to come seek help. So like I mentioned, I'm going to talk a little bit about what a peak flow meter and what the asthma action plan is. So a peak flow meter is um, something that's used at home and it shows um, the patient how it says narrow arrows are, <laughs> how narrow the airways are. Um, and so um, pretty much, um, sorry for the typo. <laughs> uh, so um, pretty much what it does is it tells the patient how narrow their airway is. Um, and so it's measuring the resistance that the patient, um, that it takes the patient when they're taking a breath. So it's actually the patient like exhaling um, to see like how much resistance, because remember there's all that mucus that's forming. And so if I have a bunch of mucus and my airway is getting constricted when I exhale, um, and when the, the, what this meter reads is it's measuring the amount of resistance that it, that's coming out or how much force can I get air out? If I don't have a lot of force to get air out, I'm probably on my way to having an asthma attack. I'm starting to get constricted full of mucus. Um, and what they do is when things are going well for the patient, they measure what's known as a personal best without any medications, without anything. And that way the patient kind of has that number in, in their, um, it, like uh, in their knowledge and they'll they're told what that number is. And then we base a lot of the other things like we're going to talk here in a second about the asthma action plan. We base that off of the patient's personal best. So it'll make more sense when I talk about it in a second. Um, but effectively a patient has a peak flow meter. It's not something we use in the hospital, but they use it at home to kind of keep a regular eye. So kind of think of it like a glucometer for like a diabetic patient at home. Um, it's the same thing, the peak flow meter kind of tells them, how are you doing, um, you know, with your airway status um, for those asthma patients? So like I mentioned, an asthma action plan. So like, you know, as I told you that a lot of asthma is maintenance and kind of keeping ahead of this illness. So an asthma action plan is an individualized plan that the doctor gives the patient. And they have that personal best, which pretty much this says, like, kind of think of it like, um, 
uh, what do you call it? Um, like your, like if you were like measuring like your best ability to like complete a skill or complete a task, like, oh, you can do it in this much time or you can do it this many times. Um, what the asthma action plan and the personal best tells us is like, here's where we really want you to be. And here's what happens when you don't meet that. Um, <clears throat> so the green zone is when I'm at 80 to 100% of my personal best. So if I'm in that range, that's green is good. Um, I just need, it doesn't mean I stop taking my medications. I still need to keep up with my maintenance medication. Medications. I need to take my medications on a regular basis so that I stay in the green zone. Um, if I check my per, if I check my peak flow meter and I'm 50 to 80 percent less than my normal personal best, I'm in what's called the yellow zone. And there, I need to take my SABA, which is my short acting beta agonist. And I need to monitor closely for changes. If things don't get better, I need to seek help from my doctor um, shortly thereafter. Um, and then you can go down to the red zone, which is less than 50% of my personal best. And so, um, and by the way, the patients don't have to calculate this. The doctors fill out a sheet for them and tell them, hey, if your numbers are between this and this and this and this, and I, I promise we're not going to make you do any crazy math or in percentages and stuff like that to figure out everyone's zones and stuff like that, because that's a, someone else's job. But it's just important for you to understand these general ranges. But anyway, red zone, less than 50% of my personal best. I need to take a short acting beta agonist rest medication and then I need to go to the doctor or go to the hospital right away because I am in danger of my airway closing off. So these are general tools to help that patient um, when they're uh, to kind of maintain things and to help them to prevent from having complications. Um, you know, it's a really sad shame, but I've seen a lot of really young kids coming in with severe asthma attacks and some of them, um, their airway closes before they can get help. Um, and they end up with like, you know, um, you know, what's called anoxic brain injuries where pretty much they lost oxygen to their brain. And so they're um, no longer functioning and they go, they become brain dead um, and patients that don't even make it to the hospital because they die, you know, at their house because of that. Um, so it's so important to teach these patients about kind of keeping ahead of um, their medications, understanding what their asthma action plan is, know how to check their peak flow, and then know how to use their medications so that they can be safe um, and prevent those complications. Okay. Hope this helped. Talk to you next time.